Hi everyone. Welcome to our second Science on Screen event. We're really excited to have all of you here. This is like a dream come true to have this many kids and families here. So thank you for coming. Um, today we have Emma Bayless from Chowanke Foundation, which is an environmental education center in Wiscasset. And she's here with some of her friends. And I think that's why you guys, a lot of you are here, is to meet her owl friends. And um, the show with Emma is going to be about an hour long. And then we're going to take a break from 2 o'clock to 2.30. And then we're going to be showing the film Eagle Huntress. So I hope that you'll stay through the whole thing because um, both parts are going to be amazing. So thank you again. And then I'm going to hand this over to Emma. Right, I'm going to make sure my microphone is on here. And it's supposed to be really loud. Part of it is going to be that there will be fewer voices talking while I'm talking, so hopefully that, that will help. So welcome everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I'm going to I'll just give you a, a little bit of an introduction of, of myself and Chuanghi, um, and then some of the things that would help me out and my our friends out in terms of our expectations for today, which might be a little different than when you would normally come and watch a movie or see a presentation. Um, so my name is Emma, and I came here from Chuanki. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of Chuanki before. Anybody? Raise your hand if you've never heard of Chuanki. You have no idea what it is. Excellent. Okay. It's about half and half. Um, so Chuanki does a lot of different things over at our campus in Wiscasset and some other properties around Maine. All of those things have to do with teaching people about nature and the outdoors. So we started way back in 1915 as a boys' summer camp. We still have a boys' summer camp, but we have a lot of other programs now, too. We have schools. Um, we take older teenagers out on longer camping trips in the summer. Um, and we have something called Outdoor Classroom for middle school students to come and camp out on our property and do things like team building and ecology lessons and cook their food over a fire and cool stuff like that. Um, but my program is special because I work for the traveling program, which means that you don't have to come all the way to Wisconsin to see me, which is two hours away. I get to come right to Bethel to see you. And my department specializes in traveling all over Maine to schools and community centers and senior homes, summer camps, to bring really cool little bits of nature right uh, to your community. So today we're going to get to talk about Owls of Maine, which connects a little bit to um, some of the cool sort of hunting eagles that maybe you'll see in the, the movie if you stay uh, for the eagle huntress. Um, and it would really help me out and my owl friends out and uh, them feeling comfy in this environment if we could do a couple of quick things. People can't hear me. Okay. Let's see if we can try to put it a little closer. You can also talk louder into the mic. Yeah? Okay, I'll just use my teaching voice into the microphone. So that's that's what we'll do. Uh, excellent. Um, so my owl friends travel around with me to different communities, but they are still a little bit nervous about coming out and meeting large groups of people. So the best way that we can make them feel safe and welcome in this space is to just be on a little on the quieter side. Um, so you all are doing a wonderful job of that right now. Even throughout the presentation, if we get really excited, um, we need to try to be excited quietly. So I'm just going to ask us to use our regular inside voices um, to raise our hands, even though we're all on school vacation. If we have a question, that's a really good way, no matter how old you are, uh, to let me know that you have a question that I'd love to answer. Um, and if you have an answer to my question, because I'm going to be asking you folks some things that you know about owls, you can go ahead and raise your hand. Um, instead of yelling out, because if we yell out, that's when it gets loud, and that's when my owls might get scared. We don't want to scare them, right? So we're going to raise our hands instead. The last thing that I'd like to tell you, there's plenty of room down here on the floor. If you're small and you don't mind sitting on the floor, we're just going to keep the central aisle free. Um, the last thing is that a lot of times when I do presentations like this, people have really cool owl stories that they want to share with me. I would love to hear your owl stories at the end of the presentation. If we tell too many cool owl stories in the middle, we might run out of time and not get to see the live owls. And that's like probably the whole reason you guys are here is to see my cool live owls. So we're going to save our stories till the end. There's plenty of room over here, girls. There's plenty of room over there. We're just going to keep the central aisle free, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at some pictures up here. 
We're going to listen to some owl sounds, talk all about what it means to be an owl, and then we're going to get to meet some live owls. Does that sound good to everybody? Yeah. Put your thumbs up if you're ready for that. Fantastic. All right. So I'd like to start with this picture up here. I think this is the biggest screen my slideshow has ever been on. It's very exciting. So this is a picture of an owl's face. And a lot of people can immediately tell that a bird is an owl by a lot of the things that they have on their face. It makes them look different from their cousins, like falcons and hawks and eagles, and other birds, like songbirds or turkeys. So I want someone to raise their hand. Uh, tell me something on this owl's face that immediately gives away that it's an owl. You know for sure it's an owl because of? Because their ears that are popping up. Exactly, those things that are on top of their head that are sticking straight up. Does anyone know what we call those? We have two names for those. What do we call those? Horns. We call them horns. That's one word. There's another term which is ear tufts. And it's because they look like ears on top of the owl's head. Uh, but they're actually just tufts of feathers. That might be the other microphone. <laughs> making a lot of noise. Um, so they're actually just types of feathers. Some owls have them, some of them don't. But they're a very special owl thing. Not a lot of other birds have those pointy feathers on top of their head. What's something else up here on this owl's face that tells you it's an owl and immediately gives it away? Yes? The beak. The beak. And what, what is the beak shaped like? Or what is the shape of the beak? Curved down. Curved down. The beak is curved down into a hook, essentially. This is a very similar hook that you would find on an eagle or a falcon or a hawk because all of those birds are called raptors, if you're familiar with that word. And what do they use that sharp hooked beak for? It's very important for what? Hunting and what happens after they hunt, right? After they get their delicious prey, uh, animal that they want to eat, they might? Yeah. Yeah, they, and how do they eat it? With their beak, exactly. You know, they're like, just say it. It's so obvious. Um, I'm just trying to get you to help me out. Should I try this one? All right. Can everybody hear me now? Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, thank you for your patience. Um, I think we're good. All right, so we just talked about how the curved, hooked beak is used for ripping up their prey. So when they catch an animal, and who can give me an example of an animal that an owl would want to eat for dinner? A mouse, very good. So if they catch a mouse, if that mouse is too big for them to swallow whole, they're going to use their sharp hooked beak to rip it up into pieces and swallow those pieces down. It's just like if we have a big piece of meat on our plate, uh, right, we have a fork and a knife that we use, they don't have a fork and a knife. Instead, they have this awesome hooked beak, and that's what they're going to want to use uh, to tear up their, their prey. So we have ear tufts, we have a curved hooked beak. There's another thing up here that no one has mentioned yet. Oh, uh, I'm going to take that comment, it always looks mad, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to roll it into uh, a feature that we see on this bird. So on this owl, someone said he always looks mad because it looks like his eyebrows are down like this, right? Kind of looks like he's wearing a mask, like it's a figure eight shape on his face. Do you guys see that? Yeah. Okay, so some owls have a, a sort of figure eight shaped mask. Some of them have a heart shaped mask. Some of them have a round dish shaped mask but they're all there on their big flat face and they're called a facial disc. Does anyone know what the facial disc helps the owl to do better? It has a very important role. Go back to this friend. Oh, you're so, it makes so much sense, right? It's around the eyes. You'd think it would help with sight. It doesn't help with sight though, it helps with hearing. So it can actually help them to hear better. So maybe when you were having an experience before in the back where you were like, gosh, I can't hear that lady. Um, having a hard time telling what she's saying. You might have got, taken your hand and gone like this and cupped your ear. Essentially, this big facial disc is like having two cupped ears behind your ear. Excuse me, cupped hands behind your ears. So take your hands like this, if you're not holding popcorn, okay? Put them behind your ears like this and make your ears bigger. Okay, if you make your sound captures bigger, my voice will sound louder and clearer to you. Do you all hear that? Yeah. yeah. Imagine you have that on your face all the time. It would be pretty awesome because you'd be able to hear all the tiny noises that those little animals would make rustling around in the forest. So that facial disc is very helpful for hearing. There's one more thing that I am shocked that no one has mentioned yet that's a very special owl thing. 
owl? Where are the ears on an owl? Okay, let's let's answer that question before we get on to the, the next thing. Their ears, like we talked about, are not up here. They're actually tucked away underneath the feathers, just openings in their skull and their skin um, at the edge of the facial disc. So if anyone has chickens at home, right, you guys know that they don't have big outer ears like we do. They just have a little opening uh, in their feathers. The eyes! Oh my gosh, the eyes, of course. <laughs> now, do owls have very tiny eyes or very large eyes? Very large eyes. Very, very large eyes, exactly. Can anyone raise their hand because they know why it's important for owls to have large eyes? Who knows that? Because they hunt at night. And how do the eyes help them to hunt at night? They can see better in the dark, exactly. So owls have really big eyes that basically give them better night vision, help them to see better in the dark because they hunt at night. Does anyone know the special science word for animals that are more active at night and more restful during the day? Nocturnal, nocturnal exactly. So a lot of owls are nocturnal or crepuscular, oh, which is one of my favorite words. That means they hunt at like dusk and dawn. Uh, so imagine this. You go outside. It's totally dark. There's no lights on. Uh, you don't have a flashlight. Can you see very well with your little eyes? No. 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 Uh, no. We, we have human eyes. Um, they're very small. We are not nocturnal. We sleep during the nighttime, so we don't have very good night vision. But owl eyes are about as the same size as ours, but owls are way smaller than us. So if I had owl-sized eyes that were proportional to my skull, they would be about this big. Okay, they'd be like small oranges popping out of my head. Um, and I'd, I'd basically be able to let in 10 times more light and see in 10 times darker conditions. So owl eyes are so big and their pupils, the black part in the middle, can open up so wide that they are much, much better at seeing in the dark than we are. Very handy if you're hunting at night. So we have big eyes, a sharp hooked beak, the facial disc, the ear tufts. We haven't really talked about how they catch their prey. So say they hear their prey with their facial disc, they see their prey with their giant eyes. What is the thing that they use to catch their prey? They're, they're banged on their toes. I love that description. There's a special name for the claws on their feet. Their talons. Very good. They're called talons. They look like this. Okay. Every owl has a set of very sharp talons. They swoop down, they grab their prey with those feet, and then they use that hooked beak to eat them. And when they are swooping down to grab their prey, uh, which are the animals they're trying to eat, um, does anyone know, are they very loud when they fly or very quiet when they fly? They're quiet. Does anyone know why they're, excuse me, does anyone know how they fly so quietly? Let me ask that very carefully. How do they fly so quietly? Say it one more time. They have silent feathers. Yeah, they have special feathers that help them to fly extra quietly. So in this picture, you can see this owl is showing you how big its wings are. It has very large, very wide wings. And then on this side, do you see the edge of that feather, how it looks like a comb you might comb your hair with? Or it looks a little like your eyelash, maybe? That's called a fringed edge. Owl feathers have a special fringed edge. And it means that when they flap through the air, those fringes basically make a bunch of slices through the air, and it muffles the sound. It makes them very, very quiet when they fly. And not all raptors are built that way. So I'm going to do a little comparison for you. All right, I'll walk around when I do this so everybody can hear. I have two feathers up here that I'm going to compare for you. This big one is from a raptor a cousin of an owl that hunts during the daytime and is pretty much one of the largest birds we're going to see around here. Does anyone have a guess who that might be? Eagle. Eagle. Very good. Bald eagle. Okay. So this bald eagle feather uh, is straight on the edge because bald eagles, like we said, hunt during the daytime and they're very fast. Bald eagles are built for speed. Uh, so it doesn't matter that they're a little bit noisy. Will you go back to your seat, my friend? Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm going to walk around, I'm going to flap this feather for you, and I want you to listen to how noisy it is for just one single feather, okay? So let's turn our voices off and be good listeners. Okay, I did a fast walk back here, so hopefully most people could 
hearing that noisy flap, right? That's pretty loud for a single feather because that straight edge is basically chopping through the air when that eagle or that hawk or that falcon flies. Owls are much slower. They're not as fast as hawks or eagles or falcons. Um, and they have this special fringed edge like we just talked about, and then a layer of fluff on their feathers. And so they're much quieter. So I want you to test your facial disc. Everyone put your owl ears on for me, right? Those two cups around your ears. I want you to try to see if you can hear the sound this owl feather is making. as this other feather, but because of that fringed edge, it is exceptionally quiet, and that's really good for sneaking up on animals, especially when you might be a little on the slower side. So very, very handy. I will have these up at the table at the end. You can do your own flap test um, and see if you can hear the difference, okay? I am, though, going to take a moment to pass around some of the skulls and feet that I have up here, okay? So I have some rules for these skulls and feet. I want you to know that these are for real owls. Okay, but I didn't go out and hunt any owls to get these things. Okay, so these came from owls that passed away. And we have special permission slips from the United States that basically says, you're a science teacher, it's okay for you to have these things and to show them to people when you teach. But they're very fragile. Uh, and so if I accidentally drop this skull and it breaks, can I just go get a new one down at the store no. where they sell owl skulls? Nope, they don't sell these at the store. So we're gonna be really gentle with these. We're gonna use two hands. And when we touch them, we're just gonna count to five in our head. Okay, when we get to five, we're gonna pass it on to our neighbor, and that way it'll keep on moving through the rows of people. I am gonna to continue to talk about some other stuff while we pass these things around. So if you could try not to chit-chat to your neighbor too much about the things we're passing around, um, just go ahead and look at it for five seconds, pass it on, and then um, people in the back, we can kind of pass them back up um, as we go. Does that sound okay to everybody? Great, so we'll start with you, my friend. You wanna show me your two hands? Excellent. And two hands. Excellent. All right. Let's do all four, since you guys are such a big group. Okay. We'll start this one here. Two hands. If you, it's okay. If you don't want to look at it, it's optional. It's optional. You can ask it to be passed around you. All right. Thank you. And with these talons, I want to point out that they're pointy and sharp. So does that mean you should be extra careful when we touch them? Mm -hmm. Yep, let's be extra careful because they're pointy and sharp. Take that one, bud. Excellent. Here you go. Excellent. We're going to opt out. So count to five and pass it on. Nope, count to five and pass it on. Give okay, okay, directions for everyone. Count to five and pass it on. Here you go. Fabulous. All right. Okay. Okay. Raise your hands. If you have seen a real owl in real life, or you have heard a real owl in real life, just raise your hand. You don't have to tell me. Fantastic. So we are very lucky living in Maine. We have a lot of forests a lot of owl habitat. So we get to see and hear owls a lot more than maybe uh, people who live other places. So I'm gonna quickly go through a few owls that we might see or hear around here in Maine, and then we're gonna get to meet some of our live owls that we brought. Does anyone think they know the name of this one? Let's see, someone we haven't heard from yet, yes. The Great Horned Owl, very good. It's called the Great Horned Owl um, because it has horns, like we talked about, those tufts on top of its head. It's also great, which means it's big. It's about as tall as this box when it's fully grown. Uh, and when you come up to the table at the end, at the edge of the stage, if you want to lift up this box, this weighs about as much as a great horned owl weighs. You can see if that was like more or less than you might have been expecting. But they're one of the largest owls that we have around here. And they make a call that we think all owls make, but we're going to hear that actually owls make pretty different sounds. So I'm going to implore you, I'm going to ask you very nicely, that during this presentation, 
we're not going to make our own owl calls. That would be like a great thing to do um, after the presentation when you're like playing outside or um, telling someone in your family that didn't get to come today about this presentation, but we're not going to make owl calls instead. We're going to put our facial disc on, our owl ears on, right? But we are going to listen to what this great horned owl sounds like. And maybe this is what you would expect an owl to well, I'll do it for you, and we'll see if we get a technical difficulty uh, figured out. I've had to do this before. Um, so it sounds a little bit like this. It's a very deep voice. This is a very large owl. Thank you. All right, so it sounds a little bit like, who's awake? Me too. Who's awake? Me too. A little bit like that. OK. Very big owl. Very deep voice. The next is the smallest owl that we have in Maine. If you hold up your hand in front of you, it's not much taller than your hand when it's fully grown. It's a very itty bitty owl. It looks like this. Oh, oh it's so cute. So cute. It's this tall when it's fully grown. It's a tiny little saw wet owl. And we're going to hear the call that I'm going to do with my voice in a moment. But does anyone know what a whetstone is? Has anyone ever heard of a whetstone before? I mean, especially um, impressed if there's a, a child who can tell me what a whetstone is. Yes? Yes, okay, it is, oh, I'm so sorry. It's something you use to sharpen a tool. So um, it's usually a stone, which is why it's called a whetstone. And when you sharpen a metal tool on a whetstone, it makes a squeak, 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 squeak noise which is why uh, this owl has the name Sawit Owl. The Native Americans have other names for this owl because they've been here way before whetstones um, were around. But so it has a very, very high pitched call, which I will do with my voice. It starts like this. It's almost at the top of the the high pitch that I can make with my voice is a very sort of high pitched and squeaky. Uh, and it reminded people like the lumbermen that were in the woods of people sharpening their whetstones. But it was in fact this tiny little saw wet owl. Um, this next one is a little bit special. This is not an owl that we see nesting in Maine. It usually lives up north of us in Canada. Do you know what it is? Oh, so the tiny owl kind of, it's cold, kind of sounds like an alarm. It does sound a little bit like an alarm, the tiny owl, yeah. Like, yeah, or like a truck backing up, yeah. Does anyone know what this one is up here? This is a very special one. It's also great, it's a great owl, but it's not the great horned owl, it's the great... Gray? Yeah, the great gray owl, very good. The great gray owl, do you see how big the facial disc is on this owl? Yeah, the facial disc of this owl is like the size of your dinner plate. It's oh. very big, which means this owl has really good hearing. One of the best uh, sense, senses of hearing in, in the whole owl world. I don't know how they figured this out, but I've read that this owl can hear spiders walking around on spider webs, which is amazing. They can definitely hear animals scurrying around under the snow. And a lot of owls, including this great gray, have this really cool thing about their ears. They're a little bit crooked. So one's kind of up here, one's kind of down here. It means the sound actually hits their ear at two different times, ears at two different times, and it gives them depth perception in their hearing. So my favorite way to explain this is imagine you're this great gray owl, you're sitting in that tree, and you're surveying, right, looking out in front of you, and there's snow on the ground everywhere, okay? These owls live up in Canada, north of us, so they're used to a lot of snow. Let's say there's three feet of snow on the ground, and there's a lemming, which is basically like a big mouse, tunneling around under the snow, okay? Even though this owl can't see the lemming with its big eyes, it can hear the sounds that the lemming is making. And because it has that depth perception in its hearing, it can figure out exactly where the lemming is under the snow. It can punch through up to two feet of snow with its powerful feet to grab that lemming and eat it for dinner, which is pretty impressive. Um, this owl, oh my goodness, has an even deeper voice. Uh, and every time I'm just going to see if it'll work again. But if it doesn't, that's cool. OK, and it usually hoots between 10 and 11 times. So it sounds a little bit like this. 
It's very slow, it's very methodical, and it's usually around nine or ten times. Nobody really knows why it's only about nine or ten times, um, but that's what the great gray owl sounds like. Again, they live up in Canada, so they really only come down to visit us occasionally. This one, though, very common around here in Maine, and it has a special name. Do you know it? Oh, that's a great guess. It looks a little bit like the snowy owl, but it is not the snowy owl. And the snowy owl actually lives up in the Arctic with that great gray. This one lives all around me. Who said I know? OK, go for it, bud. The white owl. The white owl. That's another really good guess. I'll give you a hint. It starts with a B. Oh, let's raise our hands like we've been promising. Thank you so much. Can you say it one more time? Okay, a lot of people are saying barn owl. This is my favorite uh, sort of lesson to teach about owls. See this owl up here? This is the barn owl. The barn owl is a real owl. Uh, it's actually the most widespread owl. It lives on every continent except Antarctica. Uh, it's a very special owl. It has a white heart-shaped facial disc. It has a tan back. It has dark eyes and a light beak. And this barn owl um, makes the sound of um, basically like the most blood-curdling, creepy screech you've ever heard in your life. I sound a little bit like that, actually. Okay. Uh, but barn owls like to live in, in basically warmer places where there aren't really long winters like we have up here in Maine. So we have very few barn owls up here in Maine. Instead, we have many barred owls. Everyone say barred. Barred. Okay, barred with a hard D on the end, and that's because just like bird scientists say great when they mean big, they say barred when they mean striped. So do you see the brown and white stripes on this owl's body? Yes. That helps with camouflage, right? With uh, blending in. I'll pass around in a moment this, this wing and this tail. With the brown and white stripes, we call it barring, or it's barred, a striped owl. And that's how it gets its name. It still has dark eyes and a light beak, which is a little unusual. It also has my favorite call of any call. So this is my favorite one to do. We think it sounds like it's saying a phrase in English, which is, who cooks for you, who cooks for you all? Okay? It's not really saying that. It's more likely saying, um, hey, do you want to be my mate? Or, hey, this is my tree in my area, and you've got to go find your own tree in your own area. Okay? So it sounds a little bit like this. So that's the who cooks for you part. Then they start to say some other crazy stuff that sounds a little bit like monkeys. It sounds more like this. <laughs> and people will be like, oh my, are there monkeys that live in our forest here in Maine? No, no, it's just the barn owls. Uh, and they talk like that sometimes for hours at a time. Um, <laughs> And I encourage you to keep your ears out because right about now is breeding season for them. So there's going to be a, an uptick in activity of them talking to each other. I'm going to pass this around, one on each side, and I have a request. I know we're very excited to touch it. Um, we're going to be super gentle with these. I want you to hold it like this and pet it like this. But we're not going to flap and we're not going to bend because the bones are still in here actually. Um, or the rachis, the, the hard part of the feather, and we could accidentally break it. So if we just sort of touch it and pet it down like this, then we'll be good to go, okay? So we will count to five and pass it on just like we did with the other things. Um, and I'm going to recommend, actually, should have said this earlier because we're eating popcorn, but it looks like a lot of people are sort of taking a break from their popcorn. It's probably best to either eat popcorn and not touch things or touch things and not eat popcorn right now um, just because we try to avoid touching animal things and eating food at the same time, okay? So let's just try to be mindful of that. Thank you so much. Go ahead and take it with me, friend. Excellent. All right, we'll start this one with you. Fantastic. Okay, you all are doing really well, especially with my uh, homemade owl sounds that I'm making with my own voice. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this is the last one that we're going to talk about. Raise your hand if you think you know what this owl is or what kind of an owl it is. Yes. Nice job. We you use your resources in front of you. The eastern screech owl. The eastern screech owl is very special because it can be two colors. So raise your hand if you have a different eye color or different hair color than someone in your family. Yeah, I do too. 
So it's just called genetic diversity. It's totally normal. And it's happening too in this type of owl. So uh, you can be a red feathered owl who has a brother or sister or a mom or dad that is a gray feathered owl. Especially that gray one. Raise your hand if you can tell me what the pattern on those feathers remind you of? What do you think it's supposed to look like a little bit? Right here. Tree bark, exactly. This owl is fabulous at camouflaging or blending in, and we'll see a picture of that in a moment. Um, I don't know who named this owl the screech owl. I have a firm belief that the barn owl should be named the screech owl. And this owl should be named something else. This is the hardest call for me to do with my voice. I don't think the computer's going to help me out, so. Um, I think it sounds like a miniature horse whinnying. It sounds a little bit like this. trilling call. Um, it's, they make other noises too that might be screechier, right? That's just the sort of their territorial or uh, mating call. Um, but again, I, I think we should rename this owl. I'm going to start a campaign. You guys can help me if you want. Let's see where we are. We're going to just quickly go through these ones um, just because I want to preserve our time. I know this is the long-eared owl. This is the short-eared owl. Two very rare owls to see in Maine. But I want to get to, come on. Yeah. I want to get to this picture. This is the most magnificent picture of a screech owl using that bark like pattern on its feathers to blend in against a tree. So you can see the talons are here, the beak is way up there, the eyes, and then the ear tufts just kind of disappear against the tree. Really amazing. Uh, this owl sitting in a tree cavity, which is like a little hole in the side of a tree. That owl over there is sitting in a nest box. Um, and I just wanted to point out there's plenty of things that we as people can do to make animals' lives out in the wild a little bit easier instead of a little bit harder. Um, so some basic things that you can do even if you're young is like not throw trash outside, right? Throw it in the trash can. That helps animals out. Um, people will put up habitats or homes like birdhouses or things for other wildlife. Um, and then that's really what we're doing here at Chwonky is we're trying to educate and teach people about owls so that if they know more about owls, maybe they can do a little bit more to help keep the owls that are out in the wild nice and safe. So I'm going to transition now to our live owl portion. But I'm going to do a quick um, transition before we get there. So we've been sitting for a little bit of a, of a time, and some of us are young. It's hard to sit for a long time. So we're going to do a very quick, very uh, quiet owl stretch break, um, and then I'm going to tell you all about what we're doing. Quickly talk about what we can do to make sure these owls feel welcome. So we talked about being nice and quiet. Uh, it's also important that we stay in our spots. So I want everyone to sit on their bottom, whether they are on the floor or in a chair. And I'm going to walk around with these owls. They're going to be attached to me on my glove. Even if they get startled and try to fly away, they're, uh, they're going to be literally attached to me. So they can't go anywhere. Um, but I don't want you to come over to me. I'm going to come over to you. Okay? So I'm going to walk around so people can see them uh, as best they can. We're not going to be able to touch the live owls, though. I know that might be disappointing for some of you. There's actually um, some laws that say what we can and can't do at Chwonky, and one of the things that we can't do is have the public touch our birds. So why don't you take your hands like this, wiggle your fingers, put them together, put them right in your lap. Okay? Um, and so this is a reminder that we're not going to touch the live owls. If you are of any age and you're feeling a little bit nervous about seeing one of these owls up close, all you have to do is take your hand and put it right next to your face like this. If you give me a stop sign, I'll go around you. If you have your hands in your lap, I'll come as close to you as I can um, with the live owl. Pictures are fine. Just um, do me a favor and use the zoom so that you're not like putting your phone right in the personal space bubble of the owl, okay? Fantastic. So we're going to be nice and quiet. We're going to be um, calm and still with our bodies. And if you recognize this owl and you think, oh my gosh, I know exactly what the name of the owl is because we just learned it, you can show me with a quiet raised hand, okay? The last thing I will do before I get my first live owl out is I'm going to put this plastic mat on the ground. The, these owls that we have at Chihuahua are from the wild. They have some kind of injury, like a wing injury, a foot injury, an eye injury. Um, and so they're not house trained. 
And that means that they basically just go to the bathroom whenever they want to. Um, and I need your help. If they do that, we're just going to pretend like it didn't happen. Because everyone's seen bird poop before. It's totally not a big deal. I will clean it up later. Um, and we don't want to laugh or shout because that's just going to be loud and scary for them. Does that sound like a deal to everybody? We're just going to play it cool. Okay, fantastic. So I'm going to get my first owl out. And if you think you know what type of owl this is, you're welcome to raise your hand. Just show me that you have a guess. Gray. Yeah. yeah, this is an eastern screech owl. Very good. So I'll walk around with this eastern screech owl so you can see him a little bit closer, excuse me, or her a little bit closer. Um, as I do walk around with her, it's going to look like one eye is open and one eye is closed, but in fact, um, she only has one eye. Okay? So that's why she lives with us at Chewanke and she is a rescued or non releasable owl because she was in a car collision. So basically, she was probably swooping into the road to grab a delicious animal that she wanted to eat. She hit her head really hard um, when, the, when the sort of car windshield or something hit her. Um, she hurt her eye, and the basically the animal doctor, you can stay right there, bud, okay? I'm going to walk around you. So if you stay still, I will have a better chance of walking around you successfully. Thank you. The animal doctor that was taking uh, care of her decided um, that her eye was hurt enough that uh, it would be better if she didn't have it, so that it wouldn't hurt her or anything like that. So they took her eye out. They just took it out in an operation, um, and it doesn't hurt her anymore. But do you think she'd be able to hunt very well for herself with only one eye? No. Not, not especially because she was a young owl, we think, when this happened. So um, she basically couldn't live on her own out in the wild and so instead she is like my co-teacher right she's like an educational ambassador and she helps me to teach about owls and she lives with us a chunky not in that little box that's just her travel box how i get her from place to place oh hello um she lives in a big outside cage back at chunky called an aviary um and even though she's trained to sit on my glove like this she's not my pet so if I tried to snuggle her, she would bite me. Because she does not like to be snuggled, right? She's a wild animal. She's just a trained a wild animal. Okay. And uh, she's not a baby. This is just as big as they get. It'll get any bigger. Does anyone have any questions or things they'd like to know about the creature? Yeah. Uh, why, like, why is it so tiny? Why is it so tiny? I get that question a lot, actually. Why is it so tiny? Well, there are a lot of different ways to be an owl, okay? Um, and so there's a lot of different sizes of owls, um, so different owls that live in different habitats or places that eat different food. And so but this owl just happens to be a little bit on the smaller side. Um, kind of occupies a different niche, if you've ever heard of that before. You have a question? Where is Chwonky? Where was she rescued? Excellent. Um, let's see. She came in about almost the exact same time as another street doll, so I want to make sure I'm not saying the wrong thing. She came to us from the Midwest, actually. So sometimes we get rescued owls that are rescued in Maine, and sometimes we get rescued owls that need placement, but they were rescued somewhere else. And so she came to us from, um, I think, Indiana is where she was found. And we do have street owls in Maine, though. They're not as common as the barred owl <coughs> and the gray horned owl, or even the saw owl. They're a little bit less common. What's your question? How many colors are they common? Just those two. They're born gray, like this gray screech owl, or they can be born ruthlessly red, like that red one we saw up there. But they can't change back and forth. That's just their feather color for their whole life. Um, 
And those are the only two colors they come in. And um, it's not like a boy-girl thing. So you, they can be a boy or a girl and be gray. They can be a boy or a girl and be red. Uh, it's just a genetic diversity thing. Yes. Uh, Indiana. The state of Indiana. Yep. Yep. Go ahead. What does she eat? I love her. You guys tell me about that. Uh, so we know she's small, but she's still a predator. She's still got those sharp talons and that nice sharp beak. So what is an animal that you think she would be able to catch if she lived out in the wild? Yes. Uh, a big squirrel? Yeah, like maybe a baby squirrel. She could probably take down a baby squirrel. Yeah? Okay, well you hold on to that. Let's just name a couple more food items. Yeah, go ahead. A mouse. A mouse, absolutely. What else? Maybe a maybe a chipmunk, especially if it's a baby. Yeah. A bat. A rat. A rat. A rat. Absolutely, a bat. They actually do hunt bats as well. One more in the red hood. A frog. Thank you. Yeah. A snake. Um, even something like a big flying moth or beetle. So um, all of those things, this owl's gonna uh, either swallow whole, rip up into pieces, digest all the meat. Okay. But uh, she cannot digest fur or bones or feathers if she were to eat another bird. That stuff gets crushed into a little pocket in her chest. And that thing forms an owl pellet. It's sort of like a bundle of fur and bones. And several hours after she eats her meal, she opens up her beak like she's yawning, closes her eyes. This thing silently falls out of her mouth. And if you find it in the woods, or raise your hand if you ever looked at this at school. Has anyone ever um, opened up an owl pellet? Yeah, third grade for me, it was awesome. Uh, you find the entire skeleton of whatever they ate. Is it a mouse skeleton, a shrew skeleton, a frog skeleton, a bird skeleton, a rat skeleton, a bat skeleton? It's very cool. I will pass around a couple of boxes so you guys can see some of these bones. Okay, this is a whole bunch of bones from some different pellets. You can pass that around. Number count to five and pass it on. And then bigger owls cough up bigger pellets. So the smallest pellet in this box is about the size of the, this screech owl would cough up, but a big gray horned owl that eats, you know, something with more fur and bones would cough up a bigger pellet, so I'll pass this one around. How about your question? Go ahead, we'll come back to that and then we're gonna transition to the next owl. My friend in the green shirt, yes. Um, what habitat does it live in? What habitat does it live in? Um, these owls like to live in mixed forests. Um, and they really like those tree cavities, right? Like those holes on the side of trees to make their nests. Owls don't tend to build their own nests. So they're not out there building a nest like a robin. They tend to find a cavity in a tree or sometimes even take over. I have to do that. I'm sort of talk of extra here. They have to take over um, a nest of another bird. They don't build their own nest. You want to ask one more question while I put her away? <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it's an internal process that happens in their body. It's just part of their digestion. So it's automatic. So it'd be like if you and I like ate a bunch of chicken wings whole, and then like several hours later, we were like, it just like popped up all the bones. Yeah, pretty cool. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get my next owl out. You guys are doing a wonderful job. If you had a question, I didn't get to it. I apologize, I just wanna try to keep on my time since we got started a little late and we had some technical difficulties. Um, so if you think you have an idea what this owl is, what kind she is, go ahead and raise your hand. at some point when I'm walking down here. She usually tends to do that right when I get her out of the box. So don't be alarmed, she's just stretching basically. All right, do we think we remember the name or the type? Yeah. This owl, yeah? The barred, right, the barred owl. Remember that means, oh my goodness, the striped owl. You trying to pass it to the next row? Go for it, why don't you pass it to her? And then I'd love for you to walk on this side of me. Back to your seat, thank you so much, my friend. Excellent. Um, so she's the barn owl, so she has the dark eyes and the light beak. She's the one who sounds like she's saying, who cooks for you, who cooks for you all, when she calls. I'm gonna walk around and I'd be happy to take some questions. 
Yes, something did happen to her. So she was also in a car collision, but didn't hurt her eye. Instead, she hurt her, her wing. So um, her left wing kind of sticks up a little funny. There's even some feathers that kind of stick up near her shoulder. that are kind of poofing out. Uh, and that's a wing that broke and did not heal correctly. So she, it doesn't hurt her anymore, but she can't stick her wing out all the way. And if you're a bird that needs to fly, you have to stick both wings out all the way in order to do that. So she can't fly. And that would mean that she would probably get eaten by something out in the wild or starve. So instead, she lives with us at Chwanki, and she's actually been at Chwanki for about 15 years. So she's at least about 15 years old, which would be old for a wild barred owl. But can you sit on your bottom for me, my friend? No, you know, um, the owl, the owl mm -hmm. always turns his head when you're at me. Yes, we'll, we'll talk about how far owls can turn their head in a moment. So um, owls can live. Buddy, I need you to just stay right where you are, okay? I don't want to step on anybody's fingers or toes. Thank you so much. Awesome. Um, there's the flaps. That was so late. Usually it's right away. <laughs> um, so owls of this species could live to be like 10 to 15 in the wild, but almost double that in captivity. So we had a, a very special one-winged owl that lived at Chwonky and we believe died when she was about 27 years old. It's like a great-grandma owl. Okay. Um, does anyone know why this owl is so fluffy? This one is especially like really extra sort of puffy and fluffy. Why is it important for owls to be fluffy? Way in the back. Yes. Yes, they can survive in cold weather. So this owl has no problem being outside in the winter time. Um, and she's basically wearing a winter coat all the time. So uh, some of you might have a down coat, right? It's a puffy coat that's full of down feathers. You might be wearing one right now. Anybody have a down coat at home or a down pillow? Those are the same feathers that she has on her body that keep her really warm. Uh, and in the summertime, all owls will, uh, and all birds really, will lose their feathers and grow in new feathers called molting, um, and that's really handy because if her feathers get broken, like she has some broken tail feathers right now, or um, I don't know, if they get something sticky on them, they just fall out and grow back. Summer is a great time to do that because they don't need the extra insulation of those feathers. So when I get back up to the front, I'll actually do um, a little demonstration where I'll stick my finger in the feathers so you can see how deep my finger goes, but before I do that, does anyone want to guess how many pounds this owl weighs? She's a pretty good sized owl, so owl can easily take down a squirrel or maybe a small rabbit, definitely something like a blue jay or a woodpecker. What do you think? What do you think, bud? One. Yeah. Less than five, though, that is a good guess. What do you think? Three and a half. Less than three and a half. What do you think? Less than two. What do you think? 1.5. One and a half pounds. Uh, so I'll stick my finger into her feathers until I touch the back of her skull, okay? Basically, my whole finger basically disappears right into her feathers. And that's because she essentially just has a giant puff ball of feathers, like all around her skull. So her, her body, right, her skeleton underneath is quite small, and she's covered in all these really puffy feathers. Question? Yeah, the skulls were really small, right? A lot of people were like, is this from a baby owl? They just have a small head, and then all those puffy feathers, and that big flat face, right, with their eyes on the front, makes their head look extra big. In fact, are there any birders in the audience, people who like to go out with their binocs and try to find owls and other stuff? So a lot of birders will tell you that um, when you're looking for an owl, even if you can't see them, you can kind of see their shape or their silhouette, it's really obvious they have a big body and a big head. Even something like a hawk or an eagle, big body, little head. Because they don't have that big flat face with the eyes on the front. Any last questions before we move on? Do owl feathers grow or do they stay the same size? They grow until they're full size, if that makes sense. So 
um, when this owl molts, um, she will have the feathers that are growing in are called blood feathers. And that just means that there's special blood supply that, that goes to those feathers to make them grow. And they grow inside a protective sheath. And then when the feather is fully formed inside the sheath, the sheath wears away and the feather unfurls from that sheath. Um, and, and, that, and then they get full size. Full size might be like this big or full size might be like the one I flapped. It just depends on where they are on the body. Is it like a tiny facial feather or is it like a big flight feather on the wing? Great question. One more question in the back. Can I stick my finger in the what? Can I do it again? You mean up there? Cool, I'll do it one more time up there and then we'll go ahead and switch our owls, okay? Stick my finger and then I'll head up here and she and I will try to have a mental pack and she's not gonna well Okay. All right, so hopefully my partner back, I can see that. Fantastic. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and put the barred owl away. I um, failed to mention the names of these owls. We do name our owls at Chwonky. Um We usually try to name them something that has to do with their natural history or their personal story. So this owl's name is Varia, because the scientific name is Strix Varia. The one-eyed owl that you just saw, her name is Woden, which is a one-eyed Norse god, Odin or Woden. A little bit of her personal history. This next owl was not named by me, named many, many years ago, over 20 years ago. And I don't think this is the name I would choose, but it does have a little bit to do with this story. His name is Sparky. And if you could go ahead and turn your voices off so that Sparky isn't too nervous when he comes out, that would be amazing. So you have such a big group. Thank you. <laughs> Folks find their spots. So raise your hand if you know what type of owl this is. Where I walk around with him, yeah? The great horned owl, he did exactly what he was supposed to do. Let's put this. All right, the great horned owl. So this is the biggest owl that we have that nests in Maine or is a resident of Maine. Will you hold on one second? I will get to it, I promise, okay? Um, and so I just want to point out that as I'm walking around, I want you to notice how big everything is on him. His eyes are huge. His beak is huge. His feet are huge. His wingspan uh, would be about my wingspan, like five-ish feet, to be a little bigger. Um, so he's a very big owl, um, and he can eat a lot of different animals. He's at the top of the food chain, we call it. So he could swallow an adult mouse whole without even ripping it up. I've seen him do it right in front of me, just one big gulp. Um, he could eat a rabbit or a skunk or a porcupine. He doesn't have any problem with skunks because most birds have a bad sense of smell, including owls. They have a really bad sense of smell. It doesn't bother them, that skunk spray. And they're one of the only predators that has figured out how to eat a porcupine. They sneak up with their quiet flight, right? They use their talons, they flip it over, and they attack it on the belly where there are no porcupine quills. So between the great horned owl and the fisher, those are pretty much the only two animals that regularly dine on porcupines. Did you have a question in the purple? Yes. This owl was found walking around on the ground underneath some power lines in southern Maine. So uh, he had a wing, his right wing, that was broken in three different places. So um, they suspected that he might have uh, accidentally flown into the power lines. So he didn't get electrocuted, but he basically got clotheslined. He was probably looking at something when he passed the power lines and got kind of tangled, flew right into them. All kinds of accidents and stuff can happen when you're like, an owl, especially a young owl, trying to figure out life out, out in the wild. 
So his wing healed, but it did not heal correctly. It's actually very difficult to repair owl wings. Many people have probably heard that owls have hollow bones. Most birds that fly have hollow bones. So their, their wing bones are a bit more fragile than our bones. And even like, if I break my arm, put a cast on. You can't put a cast on a bird's wing. So a lot of times those breaks are in multiple places, and then it's difficult to get them to be repaired properly. It does happen. And if any of these birds were perfectly healthy and could fly and hunt and take care of themselves, they would not live at Tuamhi. They would be released to the wild. So we only have non-releasable owls, right? Owls that really couldn't make it on their own. And, and like I mentioned uh, at the very beginning, Sparky has been at Tuamhi for over 20 years. So he is like the older gentleman of our owls. Other questions or anything you'd like to know about anything we're talking about? There really isn't. There's no, um, well, of the species we have around here, there's no what we call sexual dimorphism, which means their, their feathers look exactly the same, whether they are a girl or a boy. The girls are a little bit bigger, the boys are a little bit smaller. But it's, um, it's hard to tell by looking at them. We take a guess based on the weight, um, or if we ever do a blood test, we'll, we'll know for sure. Um, The snowy owl is a little different, where the male snowy owls are totally snow white and the females are the ones with the dark brown barring. Um, but, but mostly the ones we see around here, you can't tell by looking at them whether they're male or female. I'm going to take a couple, uh, t tell a couple more things about this owl. I'll take a couple more questions and then we're going to wrap it up so you guys can get a, a break. Um, for those of you who are staying for the Eagle Huntress movie, um, so the people who are going to be hunting in this movie are hunting with eagles on their glove, just like this. There's lots of people all around the world that hunt with bir birds of prey or raptors on their gloves. It's called falconry. Owls are not commonly used for falconry, but the ones that are, are either this type of owl, the great horned owl, or something called the Eurasian eagle owl, which is the largest owl in the world. It's even bigger than this one, um, and has sort of like some more speckly feathers. Those are the two sort of primary ones that are used for falconry or for hunting. But most of the other sort of falconry birds you're going to see are the eagles like you'll see in this movie up here, or uh, something like a falcon or a hawk, um, or something like that. Let's take a couple more questions right here. Why don't you pick one, just to be fair, okay? Um, I've heard that um, uh, owls have, like, like their eyes go all the way to the back of their head. Uh, so when, you, when I pass the skulls around, you might have noticed the eyeballs, the eye sockets are massive. They take up like most of the space in the skull. Um, and so they take up so much space that it's actually difficult for the owls to move. It's impossible for the owls to move their eyes. So they can't move their eyeballs around in their head. If you keep your head totally still, you can look up and down and right and left. But um, he can only look straight ahead. He has to be able to move his head really far around. Does anyone know how far an owl can turn their head around? Oh, you're so close, it's more than 180. Yes? You're so close, it's less than 360. All the way in the way back corner. You raised your hand, my friend. We're pretending like we didn't raise our hand, okay. How about you? Go ahead, my friend, in the hood. It's 270 degrees. It's just three quarters of a circle. So it's much further than we can turn our head, that's because we only have seven neck bones in that bird that you just saw, and most birds have 14 neck bones. So that's way more than we have, it makes it way easier for them to turn their head around. Let's have one more question, go ahead. The great horned owl? What's their predator? Oh, what's their predator? You know, they don't have a lot of predators, um, but if they did have a predator, something that would try to eat them, it would probably be something that could climb up a tree where they like to hang out, something like a lynx or a fisher. Those are probably the two animals that would attempt to eat a great horned owl for lunch, but most other animals are not going to try to eat a great horned owl for lunch. A uh, great horned owl is like the king or queen of the forest. They're towards the top of the food chain. So because I want to uh, respect the time of folks who have schedules, um, you know what, you can ask me in a moment, okay? This is it's gonna be fine. So this is what I'm gonna do. Uh, I'm gonna just do a quick conclusion. If you would like to stay and chat with me and ask me more questions or tell me any stories, look at anything that I have up here, you're welcome to stay. Um, and I'll be here for the break. Um, but for those of you who, who can't stay for whatever reason, um, I really appreciate your, your patience and your presence. 
Um, and I hope that you keep your ears out for owl calls and keep your eyes out for owl sightings. If you ever have a cool story, just you know, go on social media and tell us about it. We love to hear about it. Um, or if you have a question. Um, and I'm going to ask just for the noise that we don't applaud if you were um, thinking of doing that. Um, so you can appreciate me silently if you'd like. Um, but thank you so much for coming. It was a real pleasure. And if you stay for the Eagle Hunters movie, uh, it's going to be really awesome. It's a, it's a wonderful film. So thank you so much. And if you have other questions or stories, come on up. I'm happy to talk with you guys. If anyone wants to come and talk.